Good morning. In Fiji, we have our signature greeting called Bula. So Bula to you all. What a joy, what an honor, what a privilege for me to be with you all uh, this morning. Uh, thankful to the Lord for this opportunity. Thank you, Pastor Manny, and thank you, the shepherds here, who made it possible for me to, to be with you today. I have my two brothers here with me, and how God has providentially allowed them to join me on this trip. Um, I'm just amazed uh, how wonderful our God is and wonderful things that he does. In uh, year 2015, I had the opportunity, uh, in God's kindness, to go to uh, an island northeast of where I'm from. And the opportunity was to do a workshop over there, a preacher's workshop. This was a new venture for me. Two of our graduates who were down on the ground had prepared something. I had no idea what they were doing over there in preparation, but I, I went, trusting the Lord for the opportunity. And when I ended up there, I found out that there is no electricity in that village. And they set this hall for me to come and conduct the workshop. As I walked into this facility, it was a Methodist church hall. And I was led uh, inside, introduced to the facility. And then I came to the pulpit where I would set up my things to do the workshop. What caught my eye that day was that right beside the pulpit, there was a tombstone just next to it. And uh, with the tombstone over there, I became very inquisitive. What is this? And I uh, read some inscri ins inscriptions over there and found out that this was the tombstone of William Cross, sent by London Missionary Bible Society in the 1830s. And he came. And as I also read a little bit about him, with him and others who came. The mission on which they came was a very dangerous mission. And so when they were boarding the ships to come to the islands, people like William Cross knew this is a one-way ticket. And so... He came, and of course, since his tombstone was there, he died there. The mission was dangerous, as I had mentioned before. The natives were barbaric. Anything was up for grabs. Struck with fever and uh, lack of medical attention, he had the opportunity to slip into Australia. Get his treatment done. What did he do? The fever turned into further complications of cholera and typhus fever. More than once, as I said, he had the opportunity of seeking a cure by a visit to Sydney. You know what he did? The love that he had towards the heathen Fijians. Historians tell us that that was stronger in him than the love of life itself. And he put off his voyage. He did not go. Weary with a removal and exhausted by disease, he laid down his master's commission and slept in Jesus. And of course, it was very vivid for me when I went to conduct this workshop. His remains are in the chiefly village of uh, Tavuni Island, a village called Somosomo, a chiefly village. And at first, they had built a house over it. Later on, the elders decided to put a Methodist hall. A mission that mattered to God. I share this with you because a mission that mattered to God was successfully carried out. Gospel was preached. And again, historians tell us, 79,000 
those who were practicing a cannibalistic lifestyle turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the region from where I come. That's the country from where I, I come. Today we will look at a story where a prophet was given a similar commission. Go on this dangerous mission. What did he do? If you have your Bibles, please stand with me to Jonah, the book of Jonah. And uh, let me read uh, this with, with, uh, to you. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tashish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tashish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tashish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord heard a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. What a story. Jonah is possibly one of the best known stories in the Bible. However, many people have misunderstood the story of Jonah. They see the heroic nature of a man's survival in a whale's belly for three days. But there is much more to it than just a children's or Sunday school, children's Sunday school story. Jonah is called to preach in Nineveh. And he's called by God to preach in Nineveh, which is described to as the capital city of Assyria. And we do raise this question, why? I know we have only read up to six verses, but if you read the rest of the book, you'll, you'll fi find why. And, and I'll tell that to you because they had a timeline of 40 days to get right with God. Jonah's journey is of a different nature. Jonah is such a book that is packed with surprises, twists and turns. It is crammed with an accumulation of hair-raising, eye-popping phenomena, one after the other. There are several twists and turns throughout this book. The violent sea storm, the submarine-like uh, fish in which Jonah survives, the mass conversion of people, the magic plant. These are not common features of Old Testament prophetic narratives. The opening remarks shock the audience. Why does a reputable prophet like Jonah Take light of God's commission. Why does he despise the people of Nineveh and refuse to teach them the gospel when God is willing? How marvelous it would have been if Jonah would have done what God had told him to do instead of fleeing. And how marvelous it would be if every Christian took the God-given mission to heart, pursuing it with a kind of seriousness that glorifies God. 
Yet how sad when one fails to live up to a God-ordained lifestyle. This is an important decision, dear friends. It matters to God. And it matters to us also. So we must, and I'm here to encourage you, let us pay close attention to Jonah's story so that you and I may honor God with our missionary service. So here is a resolve not to be like Jonah. And if you're taking notes, you could write this. Resolve to choose God's interest over yours. Resolve today to choose God's interest over yours so that you may become the model missionary. In order to become a model missionary, we will consider two things today. One on that aspect of uh, following God's directives are not optional. And the other one is what are some consequences of defying God's directives. So first, look with me here. Following God's directives are not optional. And we read about that in verses 1 to 3. The first thing that we find here, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, God says, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We see here the source of the commission. Who is he? Who is he who is speaking here? It's God. This is not the first time that we read something like this. Often when we read prophetic books, we find the word of the Lord comes. And typically what we, what we read next, God says, go, a prophet goes. Occasionally, there are some who will at first wrestle with God. And you may remember someone like Moses with all his excuses. But ultimately, he, he went. Not so Jonah. God is the one speaking. That's what we see here in the first scene. In the first scene here, we see the introduction of characters. We meet the Lord, we meet Jonah, we meet the people of Nineveh, and we also meet the sailors. In this story, we also notice another fourfold aspect, and it gives us the locations. We see Nineveh, we see Tarshish, we see Joppa, and then we also see the ship. These detailed information sets the tension of the story. And the tension of the story is what will happen to Jonah and to Nineveh? What will happen? Earlier in chapter 2 um, uh, of uh, the book of Nahum, if you, if you went and read prophet Nahum, he gives us some more background. Jonah doesn't hear. But the question that we will also raise here as we read this book, why does Jonah do what he does? For that, we have to go outside of Jonah, the book of Jonah, to read what prophet Nahum has to say about this people group. And you can make a note and, and read it another, another time. Read Nahum chapter, chapters 2 and 3. And then you, you'll get a gist of why this hesitancy and reservation there is in Jonah. Prophet Habakkuk also talks about this particular people group. So the source of the commission, the Lord, and what is the commission? What is the content of the commission? What is God asking Jonah to do? There are three things clearly explained. Arise. That's not hard to do. Go. Go. Very straightforward, what needs to be done, and cry. The, 
The reason the Lord desires this because the Lord even is kind to tell Jonah why he wants that to be done. And that's found in the next part of verse 2. Their wickedness has come up before me. And as we read that, we must realize the, the brevity. The, we must realize the, the, the impact of who's speaking here. What happened to Adam and Eve? Why were they dismissed from the garden on just one account of doing wrong? Who is this God? Why couldn't Moses enter the promised land when he, instead of speaking to the rock, struck the rock? And God tells Moses that you have not treated me as holy. And this holy God says their wickedness has come up before me. So Jonah is asked to go on this mission. I should ask you, if you had read what Prophet Nahum says about this people group, and what Prophet Habakkuk says about this people group, would you go? Would you go? One commentator, just to help us understand, um, puts it this way. If you saw a bulldog attacking an innocent, beautiful baby, what would you do to that bulldog? And the way the prophets describe how the Assyrians had treated the Israelites over the years, they were also very ferocious. And God says, Jonah, I want you to go there. And Jonah is his choice prophet. So even as this command is given to him, there is not a mistake made by God that he just, you know, he did not pick the right man for the job. Because the, Jonah has had a great reputation. You know, previously he had prophesied and his prophecies had come true. He was God's choice prophet. But what do we what do we find? What's the shocking, what's the shocking surprise here? Verse 3. But Jonah rose up. We will say, Well done, Jonah, because God said, Arise, and you have done that. But only to read the next part. Rise up to flee. If you look at that particular verse, and what also helps us is verse 5, Jonah takes five, there are five actions recorded for, for us to read there. In other words, there are five things Jonah does when God says for him to go to this one place. The first thing he does is you know, after rising, he flees. Then he goes down. He went down to Joppa. He pays the fare. And then he, the text says, went down into it to go with them to Tashish. And then we read verse 5, the second part of verse 5. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound. Asleep. Let me give a little bit background. The place where Jonah was supposed to go, the voyage would have taken him at least one, one year. From Joppa to Tashish took approximately one year. So he's not on a short trip running away somewhere. This is well calculated. And so, as he is running away from God, this is not just a sprint away. Tashish was, we are told, at the other end of the world from Nineveh. So what happens to this prophet? Why 
Why is he behaving this way? There's one thing I will say over here. Jonah's problem was not so much with what he knew. That, was, that wasn't the problem. As far as his theology was concerned, he would get A's, even A pluses. He had substantial theological knowledge. I'll just point one point to you. Look at, look at verse 9 with me. He said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. That's good theology. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. He knows who's the creator God. He already knew what he needed to know. The problem was that his theology had not sufficiently penetrated his heart in his way of life. And this becomes costly for this prophet. He acted against what he knew. So Jonah is described for us over here as an anti-prophet. Jonah does the exact opposite of what was told. Jonah's rejection of the divine commission is shown in concrete terms as he desires to put as much distance between himself and the place where God revealed his word to him about where he needed to go. But he withdraws himself from the service of God. Do you know also that Jonah, we are told, is the only prophet who ran away from God and didn't deliver the message? We're also told he's the only prophet, commentators tell us, the rest of the prophets were sent to the nation of Israel. He's the only prophet he was sent to the Gentile. What a privilege, isn't it? That was bestowed on him. The book also answers for us why he did what he did. Chapter 4, verse 2. And we'll start with verse 1. It greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. So you know, you notice now his disposition, his attitude. And verse 2, he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still with my own country? while I was still in my own country. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. In other words, he was upset with God for not getting even with the Assyrians. We learn here that men of God, as we see Jonah's failure, we, what we learn from here is that men of God like Jonah are not free from faults, from sin or weakness. Jonah follows a long line of people like Abraham, Jacob and David who served God but fell into sin. Jonah's act recalls Adam and Eve's ridiculous effort to hide in the Garden of Eden, uh, Eden after they had sinned. You, you'll notice a parallel, parallelism here between Jonah's action and Adam and Eve's action. What was one of the first things Adam and Eve did when they committed sin? They went into hiding. They fled. Jonah does the same thing. But the thing is, when we read that story, how far does Jonah get successful in his mission? So his whole five-point active actions that he takes, takes him nowhere. Accomplishes nothing for him, brings him no success. He's caught by God. 
Jonah's mission fails very quickly. Dear friends, similarly, when we give in to sin, sin takes over our thought processes and causes us to act foolishly against all logic and contrary to everything we know. Sin can also make us reckless. Something we pick up from not just Jonah, but from other servants of the Lord. One application here for us is, this is not the way to use Christian knowledge. What we know should direct our actions. And how wonderful it would have been if Jonah had carried out what God had told him to. To delight when God says something, to take it to heart, to carry it out. On a similar note, our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 13, verse 17 says, If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Jonah is miserable. And he's in a miserable state. And so his reckless actions that here we find that this prophet has clearly defied God's positive directives. While it may appear that we can run from God, and some do, you'll be only fooling yourselves. Our role may not be as dramatic as Jonah's, but we all have a duty to God to carry out the, at the best of our ability. And I'll just put it this way, every Sunday when God speaks through his servants from this pulpit, what do you do with the truth delivered to you? God gives you a week before you are ready for another set of truth. We must carry it out to the best of our ability. Now we go to the second point. Which Jonah has done what he intended to do, but we find here defying God has serious consequences. Why? Because God confronts needless resignation. Look with me in verse 4. How does verse 4 start? The Lord heard a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down, and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Dear friends, God confronts needless resignation. After receiving direct divine commission, as I have already mentioned to you, Jonah's five energetic actions are answered by God's one energetic action. And God responds to what Jonah does as we find in verse 4 with just one thing. And he hurls a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm. Jonah does five things and is unsuccessful. The Lord here follows his divine prophet. And all to say that Jonah's actions is what evoke this dramatic response by God. Yahweh throws down upon the sea a gale so furious that we find even these experienced sailors are frightened. We must pay attention to that. This storm is no coincidence. The, the author emphasizes its divine origin by placing the subject, the Lord, at the very start of the sentence, reversing the more usual Hebrew word order of verb subject. Another thing that we will find in this book throughout is that word great. 
used almost 14 times in this book. It's one of the narrator's favorite words. And so we see here the sailors' lives are in danger. Once again, the language is very evocative. The author speaks of the ship as it, as it were a person struggling with the storm, moaning and groaning, breathing heavily, and finally giving up rather than continue to fight against the wind and waves. The powers of nature and even the ship itself all cooperate with God in putting an end to the prophet's vain effort to escape from the presence of the Lord. One more thing to keep in mind here, something quite serious about what Jonah's actions do. As we read that Jonah had his eyes that he wanted to rise up and flee to Tarshish. What is more serious here is the object, and that's being God, who is abundant. When Jonah is fleeing from the Lord, who is he abandoning? Though he is thinking of Tashis as a safe hiding place for him. Doesn't the psalm tell us something about the Lord is our hiding place? You think about what Jonah is doing. You are deserting your true hiding place and substituting it for Tashish. And these are things we, we picked about this prophet. And yet, yet the apex of God's creation is defying his creator while other creative objects are exactly doing what this God, Almighty God, is calling them to do. These are, these are observations here in this passage. Years ago, a young man began to nip and talk loudly of being temperate in all things. He defended his right to drink, boasted of his ability to stop when he liked. He's in the storms right now. Storms of financial distress, storms of social degradation, storms of domestic unhappiness, storms of spiritual decline. Some sins may appear to be very little. Decisions matter. And here we see God is in control of things, not us. And when we choose to disobey him, like Jonah did, we should expect bad consequences. Because from the moment Jonah went his own way, things started to go wrong. But there's more here for us to learn. And, and here we meet face to face with our Creator, our good God, our great God. You know how Jonah has treated his Lord? The Lord treats him differently. The Lord relentlessly pursues him. And he's pursuing who? A sleepy prophet. And that's what we find in verse 5. Then the sailors became afraid. And every man cried to his God and threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. Look how he pursued the only Israelite in this story. We have the sailors who are non-Israelites. We have the Ninevites who are non-Israelites. And you see the heart of this God. He misses no one. And even someone who is rebellious at one time, he goes after him. What a God. For Jonah descended into the ship's hole, laying down, slept. This is hard to believe. Really hard to believe. How could someone sleep in such a situation? The ship tossing on the sea, sailors shouting frantically above deck. And yet we are told 
This is what he is doing. He may have been well drenched because of the design of the ship. That's possible. And yet we are told he is sound asleep. It seems that the prophet's deep sleep was but another aspect of his effort to escape the presence of the Lord. Sometimes when people don't want to cope with life, they tend to pull down the shutters, turn off the lights, cover their heads with a blanket, and try to sleep until all their problems go away. Like children, they too think that if we cannot see, we cannot be seen. If we just sleep, all the trials of life will disappear. The point here is that the trouble, our troubles of life will wait for us at our bedside and be the first one to greet us when we wake up. We still, we still have to deal with them. Christians have no reason to escape life since the grace of God supports us all the way. The love of God accompanies us all the way. Friends, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, God deeply cares. He cares for people like the Ninevites who were so brutal to God's own chosen people. What kind of a heart this God has? And He does care and love you deeply. And if you are a believer, you have a good shepherd on board in your life. And he is so good that he has committed himself to make you lie down on greener pastures. I'm amazed by that psalm, how that psalm starts. You know, usually when you and I lie down, it's at the end of our day, isn't it? After we have done the day's work, after cooking has been done, all the chopping and cooking and cleaning, and then we have eaten it, and then we lay down. You see the picture over here? As the psalmist describes our good shepherd, he makes us lie down, satisfied. A person who is lying down is one who is satisfied, meaning with full stop. This is the shepherd we have in our life. He's a good shepherd. He makes us lie down in greener pastures. He leads us beside quiet waters. This world is so noisy, so disturbing. But we have a shepherd who's committed to guiding us beside quiet waters. We have three enemies that work very hard to turn things upside down in our life. And sometimes we do face storms. Sometimes we are struck. But let me remind you about the commitment our shepherd has made. He restoreth my soul. And of course, he guides me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake, this is the same God to whom Jonah is now turning his back and running away from. That's not a good plan, Jonah. Don't do that. We have a caring shepherd who will ensure we suffer no lack. You know, you know Jonah has his own logic and reasoning about the Ninevites. But Jonah, trust this God. You just do what he has asked you to do, he will do the saving work. He has said to go and preach, and you do your preaching. And if he's desired 120,000 Ninevites to come to his fold, don't you think he will, he's able to bring them through his word, he spoke the creation into being? Hence, why I say this, dear friends, it is so wrong to have such a King, shepherd, host. 
but go down into the ship's hold and sleep. We need to get up and call upon our God. Here we see all the sailors are afraid. These are seasoned sailors, accustomed to storm-ridden voyages, but they have panicked at this time. One good thing that can be said of these sailors, and you, we find this here in the text, verse 6, so the captain approached him and said, how is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. His desire for prayer amongst the sailors here. In fact, they have already prayed themselves, but to the wrong gods. And those gods that they have pr prayed to are none gods. They cannot help. The sailors were trusting in nothingness, in idols that cannot even move a hand or blink an eyelid. Even with Jonah's own defiance, we see a God who is at work. And we see that these sailors who are now fearful of the storm, how the story goes in chapter 1, that now, because of this episode, they start fearing the Lord. Wonderful things we see here happening in this in this text, even with this prophet's defiance, what God is about. We are told that fear is very crucial to the episode that frames the narrative here. A literal translation of the opening words of verses 5, verses 10 and 16 highlights not only the close link which exists between them, but more importantly, the development which occurs as the sailors now progress from fearing the storm to fearing the Lord. God has his own ways of getting people's attention. You know, this, these sailors were on a voyage. They had a mission. Depart this port, have the goods on, the, on board, and deliver it at that port. If you read this story, halfway through, what are they doing to the goods? The very thing that ship is about is they're throwing it away. Now turn around and go back and load some more goods to finish the journey. But in the midst of it all, while they were not looking for the Lord, the sailors were not. They were brought to the fold. Mission, God's saving mission is very, at the very heart of our God. God desires none to perish, but all to come to repentance, we are told by Peter. Well, Jonah is a book that presents to us a contrast here that we need to see Jonah's self-centered hatred towards a people group versus God's compassion for them. I believe this book and the story before is, it is clearly intended to teach us readers not to reflect Jonah's attitude and practice. And sometimes we can we can be judgmental of other people groups. And we could do that with our incomplete knowledge. God is the only righteous judge, favoring whom he pleases to. God sets the agenda and timetable. Our job is to follow his instruction. Jonah is not the story of a man and a fish. Rather, it is the story of a man and his God. Jonah was so self-absorbed and lost sight of his great God. Dear friends, if you are not careful, that can also happen to you and me. We also can start very well, but along the journey, slip away. People have come to think that Christ requires us to give up nothing when we become his and take up nothing. That's a wrong thought. Let me repeat that. The weakness of the present day Christianity is often on this one fact. People have come to think that Christ requires us to give up nothing when we become His and take up nothing. 
One of the Bible verses that really shaped my own life had been Galatians 2.20. Paul's word, very early days in my Christian life, got hold of me. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which now I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and and died for me. And I've been so privileged to be part of a ministry that also operates that way. A faith-based ministry. Trusting the Lord for our needs. For 49 years, the College of Theology and Evangelism, Fiji, which uh, used to be called Fiji Bible College, has operated on this principle, the principle that George Mueller came up with, to trust the Lord. And while we don't carry a budget, we don't know what next month will be, look like, we do have a great king watching and orchestrating all things. And I can stand here and tell you not a single day we had a board meeting to say we have to close tomorrow because our funds have not come to pay the bills, feed the students, and give them the education. We serve no small God. Resolve to choose God's interest over yours so that you may become the model missionary. God bless you all. Thank you.